everyone. It's another Friday, and this time it's the 63rd edition, can you believe it, of the Zogby Report, real and unscripted. This is the time when my son and I uh, share about 20 to 30 minutes with each other, talking about the, a couple of the issues of the day, often from different perspectives, but always um, respectful and respectable. Uh, I'm John. Hi, Jer. Hey, I'm Jeremy Zogby. Okay, should we get right into it? Go ahead. Okay, here we go. So, two decades ago, President Bill Clinton announced at a State of the Union message that the era of big government was over. Interesting context. Uh, Clinton, of course, had been elected without a majority of the popular vote. And then there was the Republican Revolution of 1994, where uh, Republicans and conservatives had declared a huge victory and almost the, quote, irrelevance, unquote, of the president of the United States. Bill Clinton, following the strategy of, of his then consultant, Dick Morris, decided to triangulate and reach over the other side and grab Republican issues and compromise and become relevant, in fact, take the leadership over. And so cuts were made, and changes to the welfare program, uh, believe it or not, a balanced budget. Uh, some of the conservative agenda, uh, some of the liberal agenda. But we're at a different stage. Here we are, 2021, and uh, we have a president of the United States in the middle of a of a whole series of crises that we have talked about before. And in many ways, what Joe Biden might say is that it's the end of the end of the era of big government, that in fact, uh, big government is here. It's back and it's back with a vengeance. And how do we see it? We see it, you know, first of all, his first major legislative act uh, without any Republican support, $1.94 trillion uh, spending bill, a relief bill uh, based on COVID relief plus uh, other items as well. And now almost an immediate follow through with another proposal of at least $2 trillion more dollars. And this time again, more COVID relief, more COVID relief for businesses and for local governments who have really felt the brunt of, uh, of, of the, the, let's call it the COVID crisis, but then also a look towards the present and the future, uh, all sorts of infrastructure uh, regarding uh, roads and highways and bridges that, that are in need of repair and rebuilding and new building, uh, broadband, uh, to make sure that there's equitable access for, for um, uh, 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 internet technology, uh, and so on, even more. What do you think? Is, it, is the, end of, the end of big government among us now? Bill Clinton was, was definitely wrong because the, the next president uh, administration ushered in with the, the growth of the federal government at an insane rate, and then each uh, succeeding presidency has done the same. So no, I, I, I don't think it's the end. I, I think the only time that it would, it, it won't be, big government won't be voted out. It's going to have to, it's going to have to collapse on its own weight if it's going to disappear. So here's, here's the question. Uh, in 2020, I think what was particularly uh, noticeable was that not only in the presidential race, and of course that's Biden versus Trump, but also in most of the congressional and US Senate races, that there were a negligible number of candidates and mentions um, who were running as deficit hawks, who were running as low uh, uh, low budget, low spending, um, classical conservatives, that in fact, 
even though it was a brutal hyperpartisan election in many ways, there was nobody really out there saying, hold the line, we're spending too much. Uh, this was foreseeable, I think. But now we've got a new administration and we're still you know, within the hundred days and you, you have this really interesting anomaly where many Republicans are saying, we can't afford this $2 trillion on top of almost another $2 trillion. However, I'm taking credit for money that's in the first bill and in the second bill, money that is earmarked for my district. Yeah. Help me out with that one. Well, I mean, they, they, they talk a big game, but you know, that's, that's how they, you know, there, there's obviously an element of fiscal and financial conservatism uh, from the rank and file with, within this country. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we define it as MAGA or if we define it as you know, whatever political label you want to give it, but it's certainly not Republican. Um, I mean, maybe it's the leftover populism from the days of Ross Perot and Ron Paul. I think that's probably more likely, but I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, they'll, they'll, you know, the right will do their version of, of virtue signaling and talk about, um, oh, we, we can't afford it. But when they're in power, they're going to be spending uh, trillions of dollars on other things. So while the Democrats want to, want to focus on infrastructure and the classic FDR sense, the right tend to do it on, uh, you know, defense and uh, maybe at the border. But at the end of the day, you know, you, 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 I never heard this before. We, we talked about this months ago. I forget who the senator was, but this was during the, um, the Great Society, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and some senator was saying, all I'm hearing is billions here and billions there. Who was that? Everett Dirksen. He was and, the minor, minority leader in the Senate. He was from Illinois. And so here we are in 2021, and all we're hearing is trillions here and trillions there. Now, just for some perspective, um, and maybe we've talked about this before, but it, it was either Carter or Reagan where the, the, the budget for the first time went into, uh, or not the budget, but the, the national debt went to a trillion. Now, from George Washington to Carter, somewhere between Carter and, and Reagan, you, you get $1 trillion in the national debt. Let's just say 1980, $1 trillion. Fast, uh, fast forward to Bush, I think it was about $9 trillion, $8 trillion. Then to Obama, $16 trillion. And then in one presidency, up to $27, 26000000000000 trillion. And so that, that's what we call parabolic. That's what we call exponential. So, and we've talked about this before. Does the debt really matter? Does it, can we, can we conceivably get to 50 trillion? Can we get to a quadrillion or a gazillion? I mean, does it not matter? So he, well, obviously it matters. And here is the, here are the ramifications, okay? And a real quandary. Uh, that we're in. So as that debt accumulates, think about your credit card, um, credit cards, and the amount of debt that, that you're accumulating. And you know, um, or have read, because you're very good with credit cards, but you know that um, people oftentimes can only afford or say they can only afford to pay the, the minimum due on their credit card, which just actually elongates their debt and compounds their debt. So if you think about a $1 trillion deficit in one year or $22 trillion in accumulated national debt and the federal budget merely uh, servicing the interest on that debt, not even tackling the larger problem of paying down some on the principle of that debt. And then think about the total budget and realize how much money is being spent, not on human needs uh, or not on infrastructure or not on a myriad of things like schools and 
and so on, and how much money is actually just being spent on the equivalent of paying off the, um, the interest on the debt. I mean, at this point, you're, uh, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you're talking about around 400, 450 billion, my estimate, uh, of money that simply is paying off the interest, uh, the national debt. At the end of the year, the, the same amount of principal plus whatever we add in that we've, we've borrowed, it, it just keeps accumulating. Uh, so yes, in that sense, it matters. Secondly, somebody's got to get paid back, I, I assume, unless, you know, um, banks and China and other creditors uh, do what uh, the IMF has done for years with countries like Argentina, for example, or African countries and done debt forgiveness. But how do you forgive trillions, now even tens of trillions of dollars worth yeah. of accumulated debt? How do you forgive that without everything crashing down? So yeah, it matters. And then on top of it, I mean, even though they call it forgiveness, there's always the finer print, right? There's always terms and conditions that come with that. And so Argentinians yeah. or, or, you know, whatever the, the nation is, had to, you know, they had to pay dearly for that. Someone, the, the piper's got to get paid. I think yeah, we I, always I, know who the, we always know who ends up paying the piper. Yeah. Uh, so you can raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. I'm a piper payer. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, so, so you go back to, to, uh, well, you know, there was a crisis, right? And then this is the line of argument for the new deal. This mm -hmm. was the line of argument as you've uh, put it frequently for um, the great society and the war on poverty. And, um, you know, I, I mean, and not just social spending, but then there was the war on terror and, and defense. And while it's hard to argue against that, like, well, what do you do if, if there's a crisis? Although, although I, I think a, a good argument can be made, but I would, I would just, step aside and, and say this, well, these crisis uh, era or crisis time spendings and packages, they never get rolled back. Mm -hmm. So they become permanent. You know, let's just come up with um, a hypothetical scenario that actually kind of played out in, in the great society. But let's say the government created the Department of Poverty, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you would think that the Department of Poverty, well, its aim is to fight poverty and to eradicate poverty. But because of the nature of agencies and bureaucracy, it actually never ends up addressing poverty because if they address poverty, then you have to cut the government program. So a lot of times what happens is these programs and these, these bureaucracies and these agencies and departments, they become permanent. Actually, I can't even think of one example where it was rolled back. It maybe it was given like a, a facelift and, and a new name, but I can't think of something where a president in one decade said, "All right, let's create this," and then you know, in seven years or in ten years, we're going to cut. I can't think of an example. They are no sooner created than one of the major goals right at the outset is to sustain themselves. Yeah. Um, Ivan Illich is a social critic from Russia writing 30, 40 years ago, talking about the two watershed points in the history of all agencies and bureaucracies. The, the, the agency is created to do good, but at the same moment that it's created, it creates a mechanism to sustain itself. You know, so if it's a non-for-profit, it's got to be spend a lot of time raising money. If it's a government agency, I've got to protect my job. I've got to rally before Congress. I've got to take aides uh, on Capitol Hill out to lunch. I've got to talk to lobbyists and make sure that they're on my side. The first watershed, he says, is when the agency is spending as much time and resources sustaining itself as it spends uh, 
er eradicating or uh, trying to cure the problem for which it was founded. Then it reaches a plateau, and he says then it reaches what he calls a second watershed, and that's where the agency is actually spending most of its resources sustaining itself. And certainly in second or even third place is eradicating the issue for which they were formed. This is almost a law of, of agencies, and I highly recommend the social critic, um, uh, Ivan Illich, uh, be, because he nailed it on the head. And that's where we're at. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, if, you know, we, we've talked about the issue, the, the, the problems, and I mean, so, you know, maybe we can try and tackle solutions, although these solutions are, you know, they're not easy. Um, there's never, it's never going to be pain-free either way you go. Um, it's never going to not be problematic, but I tend to be of this, this line of thought of, of bottom up over top down, mm -hmm. you know, organic over synthetic. And to me, it, if you have a middleman that accumulates the resources and the capital and then distributes it as it sees fit, I think that there's a lot of room for human error. I think there's a lot of room for, for a while. I, you know, I gotta, I gotta get these people back because they had my back. And so, you know, maybe you can call that nepotism, or you could, you could just call it loyalty, whatever you want to call it. But the point is, is does it really become in the best interest of the people who are funding it? And so, to me, it just makes more sense to to reallocate the capital back to the people or just never have it taken away from them in the first place and let them see fit as to how they can improve their lives at the individual level. I mean, in the most radical interpretation, you, you could say, well, then why do we have the IRS? Um, if, uh, if people just had the money that they normally send to the IRS every year, Hold on one second. We, we've got to take care of a little issue here. <laughs> That's um, the third generation of this podcast. So, so I mean, it, back to the point that um, instead of having the middleman collect the money and then there's absolutely no transparency as to where your money is going... I mean, that would be a first step, at least, to, to have the agency provide the transparency. This is where your dollars went. Or maybe you can have a say in it. Why, why don't you allocate it towards this cause, towards this bridge in this state, or towards, uh, you know, the, the levees in, in New Orleans? But we have no idea where this money goes. It's almost like we don't even have a right to know. I think we do have a right to know. But if you take it a step further, well, what if we all just collectively keep our money? I mean we're all not going to be money hungry misers and, and, and throw it, you know, under the mattress and, and count it at night before we go to sleep. We're going to spend it. We're going to save it maybe to invest later. You know, we're going to lend it out to people who need, we're, you know, we're, we're going to, it's going to go towards services and products. Uh, you know, some people will, will do better with it by saving and investing. Others will do better by, by spending and supporting. And, and so, I mean, that's bottom up, that's organic. To me, that makes more sense and it alleviates waste. I, uh, I agree with you. I want to pick up on that. Let's make that the topic for next week because I have very similar ideas um, on, uh, on, on the, the best way or the better way to, um, uh, you know, to deal with the, the issue of runaway spending, wasteful spending, um, the creation of institutions that uh, exist because they exist, um, and, and uh, who pays the piper. So let's pick up on that, all right? Um, well, that's too bad. I, I really want to hear, I, I would like it to be your closing statement, and then could, could you give a, a, a 60 Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been, uh, this is, I support the not only the 1.94 trillion. I support uh, Biden's next move uh, with a two trillion dollar package, simply because these are issues that need to be addressed and need to be addressed now. Issues from uh, 
uh, immediate repair and expansion and moving forward, like like with railroads and with broadband and with green energy. And the federal government has got to give the uh, you know the kickstart to to that kind of investment. Um, where I have a problem is, as you point out, how the money is then allocated through a funnel and how not all of that money that's allocated through the funnel actually gets to where it needs to, to get to. And so, yes, I, if, if these are the kinds of investments that could be made directly to folks, I think a lot of it is, you know, money to bail out restaurants, for example, money to bail out small businesses. I mean, these are things you have to do. Uh, money to, um, you know, help cities uh, who are in dire need of, of capital and where most Americans live. Um, but I also know the danger, what happens when you give direct block grants to local entities or to directly to individuals uh, who need it. There is either plenty of opportunity for misallocation or even more opportunity for hyper government regulation, neither of which is pretty. You can't leave people entirely on their own with taxpayers' largesse. By the same token, you enact uh, uh, or implement uh, series upon series of regulations, which prohibits growth. Um, and we see that here in New York State. We've spent billions upon billions of dollars directly into communities to create jobs. Uh, the money is spent. Where are the jobs? You know, very good question. So pouring money onto problems is not always uh, a, a solution unto itself, but we do have to pour money. No question about it. Could I raise a question for, for our listeners to think about? And, and I mm -hmm. don't have the answer. Maybe you have the answer, but everybody can think about this over holiday weekend. This goes back to kind of a, a, a debate. I don't know if this exchange exactly happened, but it, it seems fitting between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, where you know the, the Federalist mentality basically said to the Jeffersonian mentality, if only people were angels, then they can govern themselves, to which the Jeffersonians would reply, well, only if government were angels, then we could be ruled by government. So, I mean, the question is, the individual or the bureaucracy, which one is, is more likely to, to be an angel? Which one is more likely to, to, do, to do harm? I guess the, the better way to frame it is, is who, who has more of a, a negative impact on society? Who has more of a positive impact on society? Um, this is why we not only need this debate, an honest debate, and not what we see taking place in Washington, where uh, each side is just so opposed to each other that uh, very little merits of the argument of, of either side actually gets played out. But um, this is where uh, we actually really need a new constitutional convention um, to kind of review where we're at with a number of institutions and a number of laws, um, you know, to see if they still are relevant uh, today. But that's for future podcasts. Um, happy holidays to Christians, to Jews, and upcoming for Muslims. Uh, this is a holy day today for many. I'm signing off. Take care. Have you too. Day.